First, a little audience analysis. We are in a Smith Barney office. Actually, we're at a Smith Barney retreat. Uh, about 50, about 50 Smith Barney retirement plan brokers. These guys have all, guys and gals have all sold RP. Uh, they know RP. Uh, some are more have been in the business a little bit longer than others, but they all know the RP uh, business. Um, they've been beaten up pretty bad the last couple years. Uh, they're somewhat down in the dumps. The last 30 months have been pretty tough on them. And what I am there to do is really just get them re-energized and pumped up, uh, thinking about prospecting for qualified plan business. Okay, so that's sort of the uh, uh, audience analysis. And if I may begin, good afternoon. Absolute pleasure to be able to come here and chat with you again today. There certainly has been a lot of bad news over the course of the last two and a half years. What I would like to do is, is spend some time this afternoon on some of the good news that has come from the last two and a half years. The good news is the vital service you folks provide on a day in and day out basis is finally getting the credit that they, those services justly deserve. For years you've been talking about investment policy and risk adjusted returns. And you know what, a lot of people weren't listening. Well they are now. And because your role has never been more important, the opportunity has never been greater. And with that in mind, what I'd like to do today is spend some time on 10 timely but often overlooked retirement plan prospecting ideas. Now, before I do that, I want to digress. Can I see a show of hands? Is there anybody in this room not seen this tremendous movie? One of my all-time favorites. Anybody? Thank God. Okay? It's a Wonderful Life. It has to be one of my top three favorite movies. What I love about this movie, maybe more than anything else, is the fact that it is so very timely. You could take this movie and plop it down in just about any era, and it would have significant meaning to it. It literally is timeless. And I saw this for the first time a couple weeks ago, and I sort of had some fun with it, thinking about what would this movie have looked like had you plopped this movie into the late 1990s? And who might the characters have represented had that movie been placed in the late 1990s, right? I mean, think about it. How about our friend George Bailey? Okay? George Bailey, if this movie had been planted in the late 1990s, he might very well be a typical stock market investor of the, 19, of the late 90s, right? He's at a cocktail party. He's everybody's buddy. He's talking about the hot mutual fund tips of the day, the hot stock tips. Any big party, George Bailey is going to be there, and he's going to be talking about mutual funds and stock tips, right? Okay? How about the ultimate opportunist, right? Sam Wainwright, always right place at the right time. Where would Sam Wainwright have been had this movie been plopped in the late 1990s? How about Sam Wainwright as a hot new growth fund manager? Right? Getting caught up with the momentum crowd? <laughs> ah, the ultimate temptation, Mary. <laughs> the local gal, the pretty local gal with a hot stock tip, right? How about Potter, right? The old bear? What would Potter be? Well, how about Potter as the bear market? Stealing people's homes and derailing poor George's travel plans, right? How about Uncle Billy? What would Uncle Billy be? How about Uncle Billy as the bungling CFO? Maybe? You know, George's shtick wasn't playing at cocktail parties after the bear market ensued, and it sure wasn't playing at Nick's bar. Nick the bartender, how about Nick? as today's stock market investor, the, skept the step skeptical investor of today, <laughs> right? And then last but not least, how about Clarence? You have to have Clarence. What would Clarence be had this movie been plopped in the late 1990s? How about Clarence as the next bull market? We don't know when Clarence is going to appear, but he will appear. So Clarence as the next bull market. Absolutely one of my all-time favorite films. How can you not help but love George Bailey of Bedford Falls? How can you not help but love the guy? You can only imagine how excited I was when I found out that, yes, this year, you know, all these sequels that are coming out, a sequel came out. And it's going to come out around theaters near you at the end of the year this year, during the holiday season. And much to my surprise, one of my favorite actors is playing the lead role. Yes, this Christmas in theaters near you, It's a Wonderful Life too with Jim Carrey playing the lead role as George Daly of Market Falls, a sleepy suburb of Chicago. Now, George Daly in the sequel is a 401k plan consultant, and he is despondent. He is absolutely in despair 
over what the heck has taken place over the last 30 months. And in fact, the movie begins on the Michigan Avenue Bridge, and George is thinking the unimaginable. He has got a box of employee enrollment forms, and he is about to dump them into the depths of the <laughs> Chicago River. Now, if you recall the original, Clarence was played by Henry Travers. And in the original, Clarence took George, took him on a journey into the past, and showed George what life would have been like had he never been born. Okay? In the sequel, Clarence is played by John Goodman. And in the sequel, John Goodman takes George Daly on a journey into the past, showing him what his 401k plan clients would have been like. How would they have been doing had George never been born? You with me? What Clarence wound up doing was taking George through a very interesting journey and basically made sure that George understood how important he was in helping his qualified plan clients find, support, and last but not least, explain the best retirement plan products in the marketplace. And that was the journey that they embarked on. Now the first stop on this journey was to those clients that George had been extremely helpful and constructive in assisting those companies find the best product in the marketplace. Help them with the front end due diligence. Help them through RFP processes and the like. Okay, that was the first stop. And in fact, the first company that they stopped at was a company called Chicago Dance Company. The service that George provided this company was a retirement plan market overview. This overview entailed George sitting down with management at Chicago Dance and basically educating them about what the 401k marketplace looked like. What were the economics of the marketplace? The fact that it costs over a hundred bucks a year to rec uh, record keep and administer one account balance. Educating the management team in Chicago Dance about the economics of the marketplace. The end result of that process was Chicago Dance identifying a viable long-term partner to partner with, in essence, when they selected their 401k plan uh, benefit. Now, how did they become a client of Georgia? I talked that we're going to talk about prospecting here today. In front of you, you should see a tear up from the Retirement Plan Opportunity Notebook. You should all have this scorecard in front of you. I'm going to ask that you participate a little bit with me here today. And I would like you to complete the first line. You may need to use a black marker because it's sort of a slick uh, paper here. I'd like you to complete the first line with retail account. Retail account. It's a couple of years ago that George had asked one of his uh, retail clients, a gal by the name of Mary Jones, he asked her if she was happy with her 401k plan. She said, well, come to think of it, George, no, I'm not. I never get my statement on time. The statement's always wrong when I get it, and the investments stink. George then asked if he could talk to the person who managed the 401k program. Mary introduced George, and the rest is history. So through that retail account, this company became a client of George's. Now, how would Chicago Dance had looked had George never been born? What situation predicament would they have been in? The CFO's brother-in-law, who was an insurance agent, gave them the idea that they could avoid a back-end surrender charge by go going into another insurance-based product that had very high fees, but they made that CDSC go away. That was good news until the insurance company decided to get out of the record-keeping business, forcing another planned conversion on Chicago Dance six months later. Pretty tough situation had George never been born. Next stop along the way was a company called Global Technologies. The service that George provided here was an exhaustive, detailed plan cost analysis that was modeled after the Department of Labor guidelines and their regulations, and also in recognition of the fact that it was Global Technologies' legal requirement under Section 404A1A to defray reasonable expenses. What George did was help Global Technologies understand what reasonable meant. He defined reasonable for them. He let them know what the marketplace looked like. What did it cost to record keep, provide investment management, education, communication, and so on. So that was the service that George provided. And the benefit to this was that Global Technologies went on and identified and selected a product that had realistic pricing. Realistic pricing. How did they become a client? If you could, on the next line on your form, please fill in professional referrals. Professional referrals. Global Technologies has about 250 employees, and because of that, they, they were audited every year. And 
last year, the owner of Global Technologies was talking to the CPA who was auditing the plan, said, you know, son, I think we're just getting gouged on this plan. I really, I, I have no way of proving it, but I think we're spending too much. The CPA knew exactly who to refer Global Technologies to, because Georgia developed a meaningful relationship with this accounting firm years earlier. So professional referrals. How about without George? What dire predicament would you guess Global Technologies would be in without George? They were able to avoid billable fees, okay? They chose a product that promoted no billable fees, but they wound up selecting a product that cost three times the product that George had identified for them. International Consultants was the next trip, the next stop along the way. Here, George was one of six finalists for an RFP uh, process for this company. And George was unique in the six finalists in that he was an absolute pain in the butt. He called International Consultants once a day asking the company what they were looking for in a qualified plan, asking what was working, asking what wasn't working, just basically creating an incredible report that ultimately became George's retirement plan needs assessment. This document, by the way, became part of that plan's ongoing working papers from that point forward. And it was also the number one reason that George got hired and won that bidding process. So this was a uh, George basically saying, listen, I can bring you a lot of different products, but I need to know what you folks are looking for first. And he was the only one of the six finalists to do so. How did they become a client? If you could complete on the next line and fill in the words and letters, pure luck. You know, it was Ray Kroc who once said that luck is a dividend of sweat. The more you sweat, the luckier you get. George one day was the broker uh, of the day at his branch taking phone calls. Broker of the day at his branch when a call came in from International Consultants. And this, this company called and said, asked George if his company was interested in responding to an RFP, which he said, of course we are. He knew what an RFP was, he knew what a qualified plan was, and that's how George got this program through pure luck. How about without George? International Consultants selected a program and a provider that promoted a pure open architecture product. In fact, they promoted it in such a way they said, there, there's, no either, there's not another product we could possibly want more than this, because we can do anything we want in this product. Well, they found out the hard way a few years later, um, or a few months later actually, that the economics wound up not working for this firm providing open architecture, and they decided to get out of the record keeping business. And this firm gave international consultants two months to find a new vendor. So again, life without George, not pretty at all. How about Cicero Brick and Stone? The service that George provided here was basically to overhaul the plan design, completely overhaul. The owner at Cicero Brick and Stone had complained, in fact, he had almost completely given up on the qualified plan. He said, this plan's not working, my key executives aren't being able to sock money away. And so what George did one day was schedule lunch with the owner of Cicero Brick and Stone. And schedule lunch with the owner as well as a benefit consultant that George had developed a relationship with. Before that dinner was over, before that lunch was over, a defined benefit solution had been created for this company. The consultant had, through Q&A, determined what you folks need is a defined benefit plan based on what your objectives are. So a complete overhaul of the plan was a result of George being involved in this case. How did they become a client? If you could on the next line, uh, please fill in reciprocity. Reciprocity. Cicero Brick and Stone happened to be one of the subcontractors on the house that George built about two years earlier in that sleepy suburb of Market Falls. And uh, George saw Cicero Brick as being one of the subs. He saw the owner of Cicero Brick and Stone, and so immediately George went out to the site and let this owner know exactly what business he was in. Recognized he was going to be cutting a pretty big check. Uh, this owner started listening to what George had to say, and lo and behold, George was hired. So reciprocity was how he got this account. How about life without George? Company lost two key executives to a company that competes with Cicero Brick and Stone because they had a more lucrative, functional plan. Okay, second stop on this incredible journey of George and Clarence is to those companies. Now, once the plan has been installed and it's up and running, George now puts on his service hat, and he now provides support, maintenance, and service to the trustees of the plan on an ongoing basis. Okay, it's a different mindset for George. First stop was Westside Medical the physician practice where the four owners, the four doctors at this group, 
were more concerned on a day in day out basis with their fiduciary liability than their malpractice liability. What George wound up doing for this group, and by the way, this plan was both trustee directed as well as participant directed. There were brokerage windows, a typical physician group morass that we find ourselves in out there, right? Okay, what George was able to do was help this company reduce their fiduciary exposure. He, he got rid of and he was able to convince uh, Westside Medical to get rid of the uh, trustee directed aspects of the plan. He shut down the brokerage window. He reduced the fund menu from 130 to 10 funds. And in so doing, he also provided Section 404C insurance for this plan. How did they become a client? If you could, on the next line of your scorecard, please include owner of local business. Owner of local business. The head physician at this practice was on the same PTA board that George was, and George did not let that opportunity slip by. And at one of those PTA meetings, he let uh, the physician know exactly what he did, and in very short order, George was hired. How about without George? Physicians were sued by the receptionist 